Um, so I think one of the things that is real difficult for, uh, for most students to get is, uh, and at some point you, you get here, because when you, when you start as a beginner, um, like you learn about chords and you learn about songs and things like that, and you're kind of connecting chords together. Maybe you learn the pentatonic scale. And you learn about these like basic structures um, on the guitar, but at some point it gets overwhelming. Like right when you're about to hit that intermediate level, it feels like there's so much to learn and there's so many things and you can't keep track of them in your head. So that's where systems come into, into play. And fretboard organization systems are, I think, that are key for you to maintain that information uh, in your head. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's an uphill battle. You, if you practice enough, sure, you, you can get, you can get good no matter what you do. But, uh, um, but it's an uphill battle, right? If you have a system, it makes things a little bit easier. And that's what I'm gonna cover today. We're gonna go over fretboard, or fretboard organization systems. So if you look at the very first page in your handout, notice that we have this title octaves, right? And we have a bunch of, almost like triangles, right? With, a, with the dots. And that's because of the layout of the guitar. So when we, an octave is set up this, so, so generally when we're looking at intervals, right? They go one of two ways, they either go up, so if I'm going from a lower fret to a higher fret, or they go down from a, from a higher fret to a lower fret. So, and generally that changes, right? What strings I'm using, and we can do that for every single interval. We can go from like the minor second all the way to like the 13th if we want. But we're just gonna look at the octave because it allows, you to, it allows us to transpose ideas. So the way the octaves work on the guitar, say like I pick an A note, I can find an octave on the third string four frets down. So three strings down and four frets down. And I get, and that's an octave, right? And then the one that you're probably familiar with, if you're picking lessons with me, is this octave right here, where you are just two strings down, just like a power chord, and you move down two frets, and we end up here. So then if we, oh yeah, and I forgot one more. We also have this sort of octave, which is actually the same thing as this. We're just starting it on the third string, and because we're crossing the second string, there's always that compensation, right? Because of how the guitar is tuned. We tune everywhere on the on fret five, but on the third string we tune on fret four. We have so we have we have perfect fourth across the whole guitar, but between the third and the second we have a major third. That just means we're down one fret. So if an octave, if it takes me twelve frets, right? To, sorry, twelve frets to get from. Uh, my original note to the octave when a single string. When I add another string, I take away five. Why? Because a perfect fourth is five semitones, right? So if I go like this, that's a perfect fourth, and I go one, two, three, four, five, right? And I'm right there. I don't count my point of origin. I, I start once I move. So this is this is zero, and then I have one, two, three, four, five. So I have five frets for a perfect fourth. So if this string begins already up a perfect fourth from where I was, right? If, I, if this is my my original string, right, and then I'm moving to this string, it's a perfect fourth away, so that is four frets. So this what if I'm trying to find a note, like could be this note on that string that is that it begins a perfect fourth up from where I was. I'm going to end up taking away five. I'm on fret five. Five minus five is zero. So I play this string open and I get the same note. Everybody follow up to there? Does that make sense? Yeah. Seems like a little crazy math, but it's not. We're just moving perfect fourth and then we're doing that. So so now I'm trying to find the octave. Right, so from here to here, that's my octave, two frets away. If I were to find the same octave on the string adjacent, right, which is the fifth string, 
I take away 5. So this is 17. I'm from 5 to 17. 12 plus 5 is 17. So then as I move down, I take away a perfect 4. So I take away 5. So from here to 12. Because 17 minus 5 is 12. Right? If I continue moving down, now 12 minus 5 is 7. So I end up on 7. If I move another string down, 7 minus 5 is 2. two. So then I'm back here now. So that's essentially what I'm doing, right? When I'm when I'm finding all those notes and I come up with all those shapes, I'm just doing that crazy math and making it in such a way that I can use my finger this way. So why am I bringing all that up? You know, just giving you the shapes. Because that the fact that the third string and the second string are a major third away and not a perfect fourth creates an inconsistency across the entire guitar. Because now anytime this interval is involved, meaning the, the third and the second string, I'm going to have, I want to be one short. So now instead of taking away five, when I cross this third to second string, I'm only taking away four. Because four gets me the next string, only on the third string. So, and that's pretty obvious when we're doing things, when we're playing with adjacent strings. If we're playing something like a fourth, right? We're playing a fourth like this. And then I move to the next string. If I try to do this, it's not the same sound, so I compensate and move up a fret. And I end up there. So all my notes end up shifted over by one fret. Same thing happens with a fifth. If I'm doing this, that's a power chord, a perfect fifth. When I do it between the third and the second strings, I have to shift over. And we know that if we've been playing the guitar for any length of time, we know that intuitively, we may not know why, but we do it anyway. When we're like, oh, well, that doesn't sound right. When I play a power chord like this, it doesn't sound right. So I, I modify it, and then it works. So this is why. It's because we have that, that compensation that we have to do because of the distance between those two strings. So when we're, when we're dealing with octaves, any time we cross between the fourth and the second string before, Right, we're moving down, right? So we're moving down from here, and well, let's let's pick a different note. So let's say now I'm starting here. That will get me, yeah, that will get me close enough. All right, let's go a little higher. Let's go here, 12. I think then I'll have enough frets to make it all the way to the side. So fret 12. So again, if I want the octave, I'm gonna end up on fret 24, which on this guitar I don't have, but if I had a 24 fret guitar, I would get on fret 24 and get the octave on the same string. So moving down, the same note, I can find on the fifth string, 24 minus five is 19. So I go to fret 19, and I should find the octave on fret 19. Moving down to the next string, I take five again, and 19 minus 5 is 14. So when I end up on 14, and look, there's that familiar shape that we know, right? And I keep moving down. So on the next string, 14 minus 5 is 9. nine. And notice that we have an octave in there. Again, once again, we have the same familiar shape that we have, the one that goes down. These next ones, I can't reach with my hand, but we still don't know where they are. So now, at this point, I'm trying to find the octave, the same octave, right, from here. So basically this note, I'm trying to find it now on the second string. So now, because we are on fret nine, well, not because we're on fret nine, because we're crossing between the third and second strings, we're gonna move down, not five, but four, right? So instead of, it would have been fret four if we continue the pattern that we had, but, but because it's crossing between the third and the second strings, we're gonna only move down four frets, and that note is found now on fret five. Right, notice that it's the same note. And, and then when I go between, I, do, I could even play, play the same note on the first string, because fret five, five minus five is zero, and I'm back there. So that creates that compensation. So, so whenever I'm playing here, if I'm trying to find an octave, 
sorry, an octave from here, instead of doing this, right, I have to do it there. Is that making sense? Yep. So if you look at the notes now, right, in one position, this will be second position, I'm going to have two octaves on this note. And notice that it kind of draws a triangle. There's a professor at, I think he's still a professor at Berkeley, um, John Finn, and uh, he published a book called Modern Guitar Improvisation. And I uh, love that book. And uh, the main principle that I remember that he, um, he had this weird thing that everything that I just explained with math, he just says like, oh, there's this weird dimension between the second and third strings. So everything just shifts over because it warps space. Just kind of a funny way for him to like, just say like, oh, your shapes are gonna look a little warped when you move between the second and third strings. But it's the same thing. And he will talk about the triangle principle. And that is that these three dots are going to make a triangle and you can always find them. So like if you go up to the next position, your octaves are gonna make a triangle. So, and that's what I've kind of described on the, um, on the handout, on the page about octaves. We have these, all these octaves um, available to us. So if I'm finding that same note up here, I have it here. Now here, my, uh, my triangle actually gets a unison. Because I do have, I, I have two octaves, but they're not two octaves away from the uh, original note. But you're still describing a triangle, then you still get the same note. So why? Why all this? Well, I find that octaves are a really good way to save your time when you're memorizing stuff. And we talked about this uh, yesterday when we, talked, we, we had uh, our lesson. Sometimes when you're having to memorize um, a lot of um, like musical structures, we tend to be like, oh, okay, I have to learn an arpeggio, right? So now you're memorizing a full position. And then you have to do it again everywhere. And they say, okay, well, now I'll do it on three octaves. And then it's like, oh, you have to think a bunch to make that work. A shortcut that you can take. And then it's not, it's not perfect because when you're taking a shortcut, you are missing some stuff. Right. But it's it, it when you're crunched for time, you're trying to like learn a little material all at once. Um, shortcuts can be they can be helpful if you're in a hurry. So then you can take something and learn it in two or three strings instead of taking the full position. Say I want to learn uh, like a, a, a example that I have there is a triad. Right. So if I'm trying to learn a minor triad. Minor trail will be just one, three, well, one, flat three, and five, right? And that's my trial, it's two strings. Then I can take the same idea and play it up an octave. Since I know that my octave is here, then I can do it again, beginning from the octave. Then I, don't, I know that the next octave is here, so then I begin from the next octave. So then a two-string idea becomes a three-octave arpeggio. And it doesn't take a whole lot of uh, thinking. You, you're literally just learning the idea here. And you practice until you get it. And then you move it. And as long as you know where your octaves are, you can do that. Any any other you know triad can work the same way major same thing uh, uh. it's gonna work the same way sorry I went to the I went to a different octave so there there so and then same thing minor diminish augmented all of it is gonna work the same way. Uh, but it's not limited to just um, um, triads and arpeggios. You can do this with scale. Luis Osapa um, had a, a whole instructional video, I remember. Uh, and he would talk about playing uh, uh, pentatonic uh, scales instead of learning the full position. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
Um, he would just say like, okay, well, just learn this. And if you look at the pentatonic that way, there's only like four different configurations, right? We have this one. We have this one. We have this one. And we have this one. That's it. There's nothing else. So if we look at all the shapes, look. Look with the third, right? And then we have this one. Oh yeah, forget about that one. There's that one. And this one. So we have one four one four. We have two four one four. One three one three. Two four two four. This is all of them. Two four one four. And that's all of them. So you can take that idea and combine it with the pentatonic or rather combine it with the octave concept, and you can transpose any pentatonic idea up an octave. So you can take something like this, this will be like E minor. So that idea, and then just move it up an octave every time. So I'm starting on A, so just like before. Doing the same thing, I'm just jumping up an octave. So this, the same idea. If I'm doing A minor, same thing. And I'm just moving these things based on the principle of jumping octaves. You can do that too with a, a lick. So if you're playing something like a blues lick, they. We've heard that a bunch of times. I, I know that on this note, I have that note there. So this becomes, and in my head, it's the same lick, right? And I could play in other places, and it's it's the same. It's the same thing. I don't. I, I'm I'm not generating new material. It sounds different because I'm moving up a register. So when you're soloing and you're playing stuff, um, that gives you time to think because you're like, okay, I'm playing a lick here in this octave, I'm gonna jump up an octave, and you're essentially just freeing up your mind to come up with what you're gonna play next. So that's a pretty, it's a pretty good, uh, a pretty good strategy. Um, oh yeah, and I, I forgot about this. Then we have the um, even with scale shapes, Paul Gilbert would talk about this a lot. When you play a you play a group of six notes, which is almost um, a full scale, where well, you're just missing one note. And then transpose that up an octave, and you end up with this interesting idea. And it's all based on those three octaves. So you're taking this simple idea, you have all that material that you can generate just from octaves. And that's the power of systems. And that's just one thing, it's just one principle, it's just the, the so-called triangle principle for you know, transposing up in octaves. There are other ways to transpose and there are other ways to use intervals. But if you talk about that, then we'll be here all night. And so I'm gonna move on to the next thing, but uh, um, I just want you to, guys to know, like this is not the only thing we can do with this. There's there's like years of study in this type of stuff. But that's just one example. You guys can explore it, try it out, see, see how you like it. Um, yes. Okay. So that brings us to the cage system. So the cage system, it's, uh, it's probably one of the more popular um, fingering systems for the guitar. Uh, I remember when, um, I think it was Fretboard Logic, or maybe Fretboard Roadmaps came out. It was marketed as this like revolutionary idea that will unlock the guitar for you. And I mean, in, in a way it's true, but it's not that revolutionary. It's been around since forever. How long? Like hundred years? Yeah, it's been a, a long time. Um, I don't know exactly how many years, but it's been like, you see evidence of this in uh, some of the some of the music from like um, 
like turn of the century, turn of the twentieth century. Wow. So it's yeah, it's 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 a very old system. And, and the, the premise is real simple. If you look at uh, your handouts, notice that I have um, we have the dots, right? And then we have the triangles. Well, the triangles are describing the uh, the chords that you normally learn. And I'm sure you're familiar with these chords. You have your C chord, you have your A chord, your G chord, your E chord, and your D chord. Right? I think everybody here knows those chords. Yeah. And all we're doing is we're filling in the other notes. So out, out, around this chord, we build a scale. C major chord and we add a bar to it. Then we have D e flat, E, E flat, E, F, G flat, A, A flat, G, A flat, A, sorry. E flat, E, C. Right? We have all of the major chords. When we do that, well, the scale moves with the chord. So if I did that there, right, and I play the scale. Then when I play it here, I can play the D major scale with the same thing. Start out on guitar, the first bar chords that we learn, we learn our F chord. And we'll probably learn our B chord. Right? So we have the, the E shape and we have the B shape. And we don't really learn anything else. We're like, okay, I'm good with that, and then just play power chords and let's jam out with cowboy chords and, and I'm, I'm good with that. I can play songs. Right? And that's how most of us feel in the beginning. It's like, yeah, that's, that's enough. Why, why would I make my life harder? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, but if you if you learn these other chords and some of them are a pain like trust me a G shape a full G shape up in position I mean that takes some time to to really get that to be comfortable and and even now like I don't really like grab that chord I tend to play a more abbreviated version of it for the G shape um, but it's worth it because if you see these shapes up the neck and you see the scale shapes that go with the chords then your ability to visualize the fretboard goes up. You're, uh, you're not lost when you're looking for notes. And, and more importantly, you don't have to necessarily know, uh, and, and uh, Paige and I, we, we, we talk about this, um, 
you don't necessarily have to know exactly what note you're, you have, right? You, because out of the shape, so if I'm, if I'm in any given position, and you tell me, okay, we'll play an A flat. And I'm like, okay, and I go to A flat. Right, but I don't have to think about the note because I know that, I know that this is A flat. And then I can find the author oh, play another A flat there. And if we're playing in the key of A flat, I can generate the entire scale just from the one note. So I don't have to think about the key signature. I don't have to know that there's a D flat in there and, and an E flat and a, and a, what is it? It's B flat, E flat, A flat, and D flat. I don't have to have all that in my head. I can just be like, okay, A flat, and here's my figure. So here, and generate the scale out of that. Or if I'm over here, I, have, I can generate it there, right? No matter what A flat I find, it's the muscle memory is there. And I can do that even if I'm if I'm reading notation, if I'm looking at actual notes. Because I can I can think in a, in a relative term, so like, you know, if I, if I see an E flat, I know that is the five, it's the fifth note, right, of um, A flat. So then I, I'm able to generate all that from the fingerings that I've already, that I've already learned. So it just makes your life way easier. Um, so then going a little bit further into the, into the handout, we have the, it's called, I call it cage plus. Um, it's, that's not, it's not a real thing, but it's a, it's a thing because the issue with, with the cage system is this. Let's, uh, let's look at it in C. So if, if I, have, I have a scale here. And then my next C scale is all the way over here. So notice that I have a gap in the middle where I don't really have anything. So, so, and the way historically this was dealt with is you drill a bunch of fingering transitions to make sure that your transition between this shape and this shape is seamless. And that's fine. But I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. I'm like, no, like, why? Especially because, like, there's there are other systems, like uh, like the three note per string system, that uh, incorporates three notes per string. And I, I I didn't put that in the in the handout, but the the premise behind the three note per string system is you play three notes per string, and then you streamline your right hand technique. Because if I always have three notes string then if I drill this it's gonna work everywhere it's the same because I never have that two string problem that we have when we play in position in general when we play like our cage fingerings there's always one place where we have to play two notes so we have that awkward transition that we have to practice over and over and over again so it's smooth. With the three-note per string system, that doesn't happen. So why didn't I put it here and why don't I use it? Well, the issue, and I, I use the three-note per string system for probably for like the first decade and a half of my playing. I used it a lot. I used to love it. Especially when, when I was playing, back when I was playing heavy metal and rock and like fast music, like it's the perfect system for that. But once I started playing music that required me to think about chord tones and think about um, like the relationship between uh, scales and, and chords, um, I found that system a little bit lacking. Like it, it was forcing me to think a little bit too much. Because then um, you're shifting from position to position. And there's no real connection between the shapes, the chord shapes that you're playing, and the scale shapes that you're playing. They are disconnected. So, and that's why, you know, if you look at the majority of like the heavy metal players, they tend to play in the key of either in the key of E, E minor, or in the key of A minor. 
and then that's it. You don't you don't see it played in E flat or E flat or any of the so-called hard keys. There's no diff, there's no hard keys on the guitar. They don't exist. Play if I play in C, right? And you tell me, okay, well now play in D flat, okay. It makes no difference. My hand doesn't know the difference. I mean if I look down, maybe I'll be like, oh I'm up a fret. But it feels the same to my hand, no matter what position I'm playing in. So we shouldn't have hard keys on the guitar. Like if you're a pianist, I get it, you know, because the fingerings change and you have the black keys and everything else. There's no black frets. Mm -hmm. You know, it's everything is the same. We just move over. You're playing in A, move up a fret, you're in B flat. It's that easy. But the part that I'm oversimplifying. I'll make this a little bit fun. Uh, is that in order to do that though, you have to have the fingerings like down pat. They have to be like committed to not just memory up here, muscle memory. Your hand has to know it. Because then you just move and forget about it. So it simplifies your thinking. And that's that's the whole point of this, is we need to free up um, our cognitive resources so we can actually make music. If you're if you're so uh, hung up on, on trying to uh, play the right notes, you don't have enough space to create anything. Right? And that's, and so that's why in the beginning, I'm like, just play the pentatonic scale. Right? Play the pentatonic scale, have fun with it. Why? It's easy. So then you can actually be creative with it. But then later, we'll, we'll learn all the fingerings to the same level as that first pentatonic fingering that we learned. You know, day, maybe not day one. Can you do it on any area of the guitar? Absolutely. Any area, any area of the guitar. So so what happens is, and I, I'm about to uh, to go into that, so we're gonna we're gonna look at this in the um, in the key of uh, in the key of C and then we'll change keys and do things move things around a little bit. Um, but yes you can you can play any fingering anywhere. Now what's uh, the catch uh, to that is that your your key is gonna change based on where you're starting from. So you have to pay attention to the roots, right? And then your root is gonna depend on like what, what modal sound you're going for. So if you're playing uh, if you're playing major, then you focus on the one, Dorian, you focus on the two, and so on. And we're not gonna talk about modes because that, that's a whole other class, <laughs> talking about modes and uh, different keys and everything. And the major scale is not the only scale that exists. The only pan scale that exists. We, we also have harmonic minor and harmonic major, melodic minor, um, scales like that. But the good news is that if you if you learn the major scale real well, then you can relate those new those new scales um, to the major scale. So, for instance, let's say you learn the major scale. And then you're like, okay, well, I, I want to, you know, have access to some of those like jazz sounds that some of those people play. I want to, I want to learn a jazz scale. What should be the first one that I only know how to play is pentatonic scale and the major scale. What's a good jazz scale for me to learn? We learn the melodic minor scale. Okay, what's the melodic minor scale? Play a major scale and lower the third. I know, I know. You know, if we if we look at music theory, right? We know that it's a natural minor scale with a raised six and a raised seven. But it's the same thing as a, ma as a major scale with a lower third. So we're doing the same thing. So if I'm playing C major and I go C. Right? And then I know like this is my one, C, right? I don't even have to know that it's C. I just have to know this is one. And then I know because I know octaves, I know that C is here and there. I don't have any more octaves in this position. So there are my two C's. So we're circling right back to octaves. So then from there, if I need to uh, lower the third, I just count. One, two, three. Okay, that's the number I gotta change. So then I go one, two, three, flat three. Minor sound is darker than major. 
major is just a major scale with a flat six. So I count again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that's the note I gotta change. So I move it down. So then I have one, two, three, four, five, flat six, seven. Because the harmonic minor is a minor, central minor scale with a raised seven. So the major scale and the minor scale are the same scale. It drives me crazy when people are like, okay, now teach me the fingerings of the minor scale. You already know them if you know the major scale. It's the same fingering. You just start it on the sixth degree, and then you have minor. So if I want to play C major. I'm already playing A minor, it's the same thing. Right? But you're like, I don't believe you. It sounds like C starting from A. Okay, so let's take the same fingering and start it on C. And do the same thing. Right? So that would be the same as E flat major. Right? So we're gonna play here. shapes by rope and, and you're okay I memorized that shape I don't know where the root is I don't know anything I just memorize the shape I don't know why I did it my teacher told me to do it and that's it then yeah then, then, then you're gonna have to every time you have to restart the process every single time you, you are learning something new and, and that drives me nuts because why why would you do that when uh, you can systematize everything and it makes things like so much easier so now about this cage plus, I never talked about it. The only thing that we're doing is we're, we're uh, filling in the gap across the fretboard. So there's five chords. That's true. That much is true. So if I want to play C, right, I can play C like this, and I can play C like this, and then C like this, C like this, C like this, and then I'm back. This is the bar chord version of the C that I played at the beginning. Right? So there's five different ways that I can play a C chord, and that's true of any, all of them. So you can think of them, you can think of the chords as, okay, I have five different ways to play any given chord, right? Or any chord is every chord. So every, any chord is every chord. If I play a D chord and add a bar to it, it can turn, it can turn into any chord that I want. It can be E, it can be F, it can be anything. Same thing is true for my C, same thing is true for my E, same thing G, all of them. So any chord is every chord. Provided that you play it in the right spot, right? So if, if every chord is, if any chord is every chord, and we know that we only have five chords, then stands to reason that there's five different ways to play any one given chord. Right? If I'm telling you, you're only allowed to play A, 
and there's only five ways that we can do it because there's only five chord possibilities on the guitar. We have five master shapes, if you want to call them that. And those are the shapes that sort of like give birth to our scale. So if I play A, so play A major here, this shape, and I play my A major in this position. You were asking me if I can do this in, in any position, uh, Ryan, and right now I'm showing you that, you, yes, you can, right? I, ch I just changed the key. I'm, I'm not in C anymore. Now I'm in A. So then I go to A here, and hit my shape. Second position and our um, what is this? Fifth position? No, I'm sorry, seventh position. Yeah, seventh position. And then there's another big one between between, and you didn't really get to see it in uh, um, in A, but between our our twelfth position and this position over here on the fourteenth fret. You didn't get to see it in A because that position happens to be an open position for A. But if I do it in C, you see it. Because it will be the gap between second position and fifth position. So we need something to fill in the middle. Um, because there's only five chords, those scales are gonna share the chords. And if you look at the, the diagrams right there, you look at the, at the triangles, and what, I, what I call cage plus, you're gonna see that, um, I should number these, that, that was an oversight on my part. But if you, if you look at the, like the first two, notice that the chord is the same. You guys see that? The, this chord in second position and this chord in third position is the same chord. Well, I'm sorry, I moved. This chord and this chord are the same. The difference is in the scale. I can play this, C in second position. really fourth position with a stretch and I end up with the same chord and notice and if you if you look at the scale you're gonna see that the notes of the chord still land within the scale whether you play it in second or or fourth position is that making sense and then the same thing is going to happen again if you look at the, what is this, the fourth and the fifth uh, fingerings. So if we're playing in seventh position, in the key of C. The fingering, the word the chord rather that is up, out of there is the that one. And if I play in ninth position, Essentially, the entire fretboard cover, you have seven different positions that you can play in, in any one given key. The, uh, the other thing, the other application of this is, and, and I think I'm doing this with about maybe a quarter of my students, um, is we can also take the, uh, um, the same shapes and keep them in the same position and then run them, we end up playing through all 12 keys. 
if we want. Well, not all 12, we'll play through seven keys. And then we have access to the other, uh, the remaining five, just by changing the position by one fret. So let's say we start, I mean, I'll just do it the way I've been teaching you also. So those of you who are familiar with the system will know it. We've been doing it in fifth position. So if, we, if I'm in for six, six, between six and fifth position, so then I play in A major. Right? And then I, my next key would be D, if I follow the circle of fifths backwards, right? So then I have D. And then my next key would be G. signatures or anything like that. I just run through the fingerings. And that's, once again, that's the power of systems. It's not just me being like super smart and, and you know. No, it's, it's the, the system works. Um, and um, so then application for this stuff, right? That's the, um, that's the other thing. Because playing scales is one thing, but then um, what do you use them for, right? Um, obviously, you can use them to develop technique. That's a, that's a really good way and really get comfortable with the fretboard and everything else. But ultimately, you're trying to make music with this stuff. Um, if you never use it, if you never use the scales, I tell students all the time, if we can write exercises on paper, if they stay on the paper, they are used. You might as well not have learned anything because you really did it. You stayed on the paper, right? So we need to apply it, we need to take this stuff and, and actually use it. So um, if you are like playing uh, improvised music, that's that's an obvious. Um, What's improvised? So something like, Eva, you wanna come up? So this is not uh, something that we've written or pre-rehearsed or anything like that. Uh, I'm just gonna have you play some chords and I'm gonna play something over the top of it. I'm gonna make up a melody over to what she's playing.
basically that, right? So the, the, the source of the material that I was coming up with is the scale fingerings that I gave you guys. Um, I, um, I, the corporation that she was playing was in the key of B minor. So B minor is the same as D major. So then th that gave me the note set that I can play. So I, with, with confidence, I know that uh, as long as I stay within the key of D, all the notes that I play are gonna be correct. And um, that's the that's basically how that works. So that, that's an example of improvised music, right? It can be more complex, like we could go over like set of like chord changes and stuff like that. Um, but that that just kind of falls outside of the scope of this. We could play something like a, like a standard, something like Blue Bosa with two different like chord sets or two different key sets, right? Note sets, sorry, two different keys. Um, and then basically change or flip flop back and forth between two different keys. And all that makes it's it's easier if you if you understand the uh, or rather if you have the scale fingerings already um, together. If if you don't have them, then every time a key change happens, then you're freaking out mid song because it's like oh like. What notes was changed? Like, what, what do I need to change so I so I don't sound bad? But if you uh, but if you have the fingerings down, it's like okay, I go from this finger into that fingering, and it's no different than changing chords. It's the same thing. So, yeah. to improvise is that like backtracking? Yeah, like you, you could do that. Like you, you could play with a backing track. You can okay. you can play like background music. If, you know, it's. Uh, I was yeah. Okay. I'm just... YouTube has. Yeah, YouTube has a bunch of backing key, tracks. Tempo. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, and you can do that. And essentially, that's that's it. That's an excellent way to take this material and practice it. Is you know you can grab a backing track off of YouTube, right. and uh, um, back in the day, you know you had to use a looper. Now you don't even have to do that. What's a looper? A looper is a pedal that allows you to say like, if if it was just me and I didn't have any friends, and then I'm <laughs> I'm trying to play guitar, and but I can call a friend to play for me, then I just. Uh, step on the looper, and I play the chords that Eva was playing, and then the looper will essentially play back, the recording will play back what I'm, uh, what I'm playing. So, so then I can improvise over my own um, um, backing track, essentially. So that's, that's how that, that's how that kind of work. Um, what else, did we cover everything? Do you guys have any questions? I know we went over it kind of a lot today. <laughs> no questions? No? I'm sure later I'll have questions. Okay, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you, if you have access to like a course. sequence for picking. A sequence for picking? Yes. Like, a... like within the scale? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally, like they work just like with the pentatonic. So like, if you, um, so if you, um, um, you learn, I know, I know I've taught you this, from the better, if you play pentatonic scale and you play it, you play it straight, and then you can play in groups of three. You can play in groups of four. So it said like I want to play the same thing, same position, I'll just play it in C. So you can play groups of three. something out of this you learned something mm -hmm. yeah. nice okay guys well thanks so much for coming
And uh, yeah, that's gonna wrap it up.